Hello, and welcome to this uh, special retro review of the 1980 television production of Shogun, starring Richard Chamberlain, Toshiro Mifune, based on the book by James Clavell, which was a best-selling book in the um, late 1970s. I mean, there was a time where you couldn't go anywhere without seeing that on someone's coffee table somewhere. Um, it would also turn up at numerous car boot sales and jumble sales and charity shops um, over the years. But yeah, James Clavell's um, Shogun was in many ways um, the television miniseries event, which uh, led to many other um, TV miniseries being greenlit. That's kind of what's really interesting about this show. It kind of opened the door. I know David Macy's been waiting months to see this review. Um, I'm sorry it's been delayed so many times. Hi, Jamalama. So um, <clears throat> this re this review, which is live, of course, so if you're um, a fan of the show and you want to chuck in any comments, uh, please do so. I wanted to do this live because I uh, wanted to talk about my um, personal experience of seeing this for the first time. So I was very young when this was on, but this was advertised to F-U-C-K on the television, constantly, constantly advertised, um, you know, the big television event of the year. It was a bit like Winds of War, which followed it um, a year or two later. This was, it was just constant. It was relentless. Um, Tele television av advertising you know the, the the tv event that you must see and um they trailered it for weeks on itv and then they showed it um i believe it was over four consecutive i want to say four or five consecutive nights um uh and uh it was a uh, you know you kept seeing clips with ninjas in. So I was like begging my parents to let me stay up and watch this show. Um, and um, I succeeded. Um, but I do remember that I fell asleep during parts of it because it's not really a show aimed at kids, particularly not young kids. Uh, let's just do a quick breakdown um, of the show itself. So, um, Captain Blackthorn, who is played by Richard Chamberlain, who you can, can see there in, in, in his uh, glory, um, uh, is basically a um, uh, captain from the West um, uh, who sails uh, to what they refer to as the Japans in, in, in the show, um, seeking kind of fame and fortune and riches and trade and all of the things that did. Um, it's a Dutch trading ship uh, called the Erasmus. Um, and um, during a violent storm, uh, he's searching for um, passage through the Japans. Uh, uh, the ship is uh, blown onto the rocks um, at a place called Anjiro, um, which is on the eastern coast of Japan. Um, Japan. So John Blackthorn, the ship's English navigator, is taken prisoner by samurai warriors. Um, and uh, later he's released, but only under the condition that he adapts to Japanese culture, which he does uh, in order to survive. Um, he's got both uh, enemies uh, in the form of not only um, Japanese um, politicians and military people who don't particularly like him, but there's also a load of people from various religious orders from Spain and Portugal um, who don't particularly like him either. Um and um, however, he gains favour with uh, Lord Toronaga, who's played by um, Toshiro Mifune, and um, uh, ultimately starts rising through through the ranks, um, causing uh, his enemies um, much chagrin. Um, and um, uh, basically, uh, he is sort of heading towards. He's competing with other samurai warlords. Uh, for the very powerful position of shogun, hence the title, which is basically the military governor of Japan. Uh, this is um, a, a, just over nine hours, seven minutes in length. It was also released as a theatrical movie, and the movie is terrible. Don't ever watch the film. 
uh, watch the, the, the TV series. Uh, now, uh, one of my um, subs to the channel and a fellow collaborator, Darth Plato, is a big fan of this show and uh, uh, offered to come on and talk about it with me. So I said, yes, please. Here he is. Hello, sir. Thanks for having me on, Lance. Ah, uh, no worries. Is it your first time on my channel, though, is it? It is, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. well, welcome. welcome. Uh, okay, did you read the book? Uh, I did, actually, but okay. um, when I was in my teens, and um, I have a feeling that I didn't finish it. I mean, you'll have to forgive me because my memory from that period is is pretty vague, but um, I, I remember owning it. I picked it up at a, at a jumble sale. Um and um a bit like car boot sales if you know what those are um back and that the jumble sales were great places for finding comics um back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s so i used to go there hunting for like comics and annuals and, and this kind of thing and if you were really lucky you'd, you'd you'd get whole comic collections that kids had turfed out you know older kids who didn't want them anymore so I come back with all sorts and I came back with a whole load of books and I came back with this one. And, and I, I think um, another book called Whirlwind. Do you remember that? No, I don't. I think it was written by Clavel as well, I want to say, um, <clears throat> which is to do with, uh, I think it's to do with hostages in Iran and, and, and that it, it's, it's centered around that kind of politics. Um, and um, I think, yeah, it was called Whirlwind. That's right. Uh, had, had a massive AK-47 on the front uh, of that book. Um, so, yeah, so I, I brought that back. Um, so I, 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 my, 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 uh, this is all from the TV show. Um, I've seen it in its entirety three that's times. A, that's, a, that's a great scene, by the way. <laughs> yeah, this is when he pretends to be mad, isn't it? I think, and he does the silly dance, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, which is, I think, in the first. I think it's in well, the first. He's not, he's not really dancing. He's just going berserk. <laughs> yeah, well, he just like pretends to be mad, and and that kind of foils an assassination. Yeah. He, he's he's playing into their bias of outsiders are just barbarians. So he's just jumping around, and and so they're all, and so they're all looking like, yep, he's a barbarian, all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I, um, yeah, I first saw this when it um, debuted on television. I believe um, it was shown around the world simultaneously, um, September the 15th to the 19th, 1980. That sounds um, about right. That sounds about right. Did you see it when it first came out? Yeah, I did. I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. So I remember... Um, that the last episode i think it started on like a wednesday evening and i think it finished on like a saturday and um the last episode had quite a lot of action or well, second from last episode had yeah quite the, a lot the, of the, the fifth the fifth one was the attack on the castle yeah right you're right um and that sequence was was pretty amazing um Naturally, it, it, I mean, it's it, it's it's not bad. It's still kind of here we are outside in the castle grounds. Here we are inside the studio, but um, it, it it is a it is a well shot scene um, or well shot sequence rather, and um, I enjoyed watching it again. But this show is um, very 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 dialogue heavy, and one of the decisions yes. that they made, and I remember this being quite controversial at the time was that um they consciously chose not to have subtitles when the japanese right. actors were speaking that's right um, I, I wondered about that at the time but when i got older i appreciated it yeah well the reasoning behind it which definitely wouldn't fly with an audience today i have to say um was to put the audience in the shoes of richard chamberlain's character right. That's right. Who didn't speak Japanese so that you could only guess what they were saying. And I get that. And I get that that was kind of interesting. And in 1980, when we weren't used to seeing lots of foreign television and films in the mainstream, subtitles were kind of a foreign thing to a lot of people. Um, 
that kind of worked and added to the mystery and occasionally um Orson Welles would sort of read out a bit of quote uh, about what some character had just said or was thinking or plotting um, to fill in the kind of Japanese narrative. Um, I'm not sure that, that that's dated very well. Um, I find the bits where Orson Welles suddenly does his narration, which I think he did on, I think it might have been him on um, The Winds of War doing the same thing. Works great on that. Um, yeah, that the, there is, there is a narrative voice in Shogun, but it only it only happens a few times. Yeah, it's it's about like four or five times, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, to explain a few key key moments. Um, one thing that's really interesting about this show, it was it, it's the very first miniseries to shoot, backed by Western Finance, um, to shoot entirely in Japan. Um, all of it, it was, was shot. Yeah. yeah, it was in Japan. Yeah, yeah, all of it, all of it was shot in Japan. Not just um, the exteriors and all the kind of uh, Japanese landscape that you see and all of that lovely stuff, but um, all the rest of the stuff, uh, all the interiors, all the studio stuff. Studio sh stuff was all shot here at Toho Film Studios, which consists of um, this section of property and then also. These studio spaces are uh, just located just north of that. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like they have a back lot um, at Toho Studios, unless this is it. But I don't think I don't think so. Well, how so much has that? How much has that changed in the last forty-five years? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> it's still a working studio, and it's also where they shoot, um, where they have shot a lot of God Godzilla stuff. So a lot of the Godzilla stuff uh, has been filmed here. Um, yeah, the, in 1980, this area would have been nowhere near as built up as this. So they probably would have had a bit of a back lot and uh, more stuff to play with um, back then. Um, so uh, it had a, a, um, a pretty big, well, it had a huge cast um, of a lot of very well-known Japanese actors, um, the only one of, of whom some Western Western audience people at the time would have known would have been Toshiro Mifune from his work on Seven. Yeah, I heard that the uh, the actor for Yabu was a was a well known comic. I think, um, yeah. Uh, oh, you mean uh, um, from Reiki Seiki? Uh, that's the guy with the bald head who has to um, uh, commit um, the act of I forget the name of it now, but uh, he has to do the honorable honorable suicide thing um yeah, his, yeah 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 the, in the book he's very detailed in the book it's not nearly as detailed in the tv series in the book they show him sitting in, at his sitting at home with his family and his, he's talking to his wife talking about the politics of of what's happening to their family it's pretty extensive sure you by the way you're getting a bit of feedback on your mic when you're using it or it's, it it just sounds like there's a wind turbine on in the background. As someone's yeah, pointed yeah, it. yeah. My computer's humming. I apologize for that. I, I'm I'm turning off the mic when I'm not talking. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I got that. I appreciate that. Uh, well, guys, you'll just have to. It's not too bad. We can hear what you're saying, which is the which is the main thing. <laughs> Tom, is your sound rigged up to a wind turbine? No, it's just his computer's very loud. It's one of the old computers with a little gnome inside it that's got a cranking handle and keeps the power on. That kind of thing. So yeah, my, my 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 motherboard CPU is about uh, fifteen years old. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Irene says my mum had it recorded on VHS, so I watched it as one giant movie over and over again, like Lord of the Rings. Yes, yeah, yeah but never watched the movie edit of the, the abridged version. The of movie it. edit's terrible. Um, yeah, even the terrible. action scenes in the movie edit uh, are edited down. It's 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 a terrible terrible. It's just like um. I mean, it just doesn't hang together. Um, and uh, some of the most powerful moments in this show are, um, are the moments where they take their time, um, like the funeral and all the rest of it. Um, but uh, let's let's talk about the cast uh, a little bit more. So um, Richard Chamberlain is in the lead. Then you have um, a number of kind of established European character actors in this film the first is leon yeah, that, lessig yeah that guy uh, there he's only in the first episode i think uh i think you're right yeah he's part of the kind of 
Spanish slash Portuguese um, contingent, of which there are various political, um, various political and religious characters, kind of vying for power within the Japanese narrative to the extent that they can. And um, they see Blackthorn, aka Richard Chamberlain's character, also known as Ajin San, um, as as a potential threat to their uh, religious interests and and power with the Japanese. Yeah, um, I can elaborate. I can elaborate that a little later. Yeah, uh, you sh- yeah. Let's all right. Well, let's we'll go through the cast. Uh, Toshiro Mifune, um is uh, uh, Lord Tanaga. Um, this was probably the first time. I'd seen him in anything because I hadn't seen The Seven Samurai when I watched um, Shogun. Because don't forget, I was just a kid. Yeah, same for was... me. That same for me. The first time I ever saw him. Yeah, it wasn't like Seven Samurai was on, uh, you know, on the telly every week. Yeah, the, the second time I saw him was actually in the Bronson movie Red Sun. Yeah, I saw that. I, I can't. I don't know if I saw that after Shogun or before. But and I watched it again recently. It actually holds up surprisingly well. That movie. Yeah, I love that movie. Cowboy, cowboy, Very, and, a, and a and a shogun warrior kind of taking on uh, people in the Wild West is a pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, very movie. underrated movie. Yeah, most people will have forgotten about it now. They'll probably get remade soon. Yeah, uh, that's Frankie. Right Frankie Saiki is is he's kind of like um, isn't he the I suppose his official. Would you what would you explain his official position as when we first meet him? He's a he's a daimyo uh, uh, that owns the village. Right. Um. Yeah, where one poor fisherman loses his head pretty quickly. Um. To shoot him at again. Now, Yoko um, Shimada, who plays um, Blackthorn's love interest. Um, it was interesting to read that when she did this, she actually hardly spoke any English and she had to read most of her lines off what we call in the industry an idiot board. And I don't mean to suggest that she was one. Um, she learned more English as she went along and she completed the rest of her dialogue in ADR in post-production. I tried to get hold of her for an interview only to sadly learn that she passed away in 2022. So pretty recently, um, at the relatively young age of 67. So it was quite sad to, to, to learn that. So she must have been very young when she shot Shogun, probably only 18 or 19 maybe. Um, but, uh, yeah, she's fantastic in this, though. And, and, she's, uh, and she's also based on a real person. Right, as is, as is Richard Chamberlain's um, character, William someone. I, I forget the name of the captain. Um, and uh There's William I'll, Adams. William Adams, thank you. Uh and I would say that um Yoko's performance in this um as a Japanese actress, she would probably be the first Japanese actress exposed to Western audiences on a global level on their television sets. Um I can't think of another show up to this point that would have given a Japanese actress that much exposure to a very mainstream um, Western audience. Of course, it's all changed now. But Shogun, what people need to understand is Shogun was the first. It was the first big miniseries that was greenlit with a huge budget. It was a huge risk as well. If this TV show had bombed, if it wasn't successful, we would not have... um, seen the likes of shows like North and South, um, uh, you know, the Blue and the Grey and all those other ones that came afterwards. And, of course, now um, miniseries and series are, are, are you know, thriving. Uh, uh, I, I never I never would have thought about that. I appreciate you telling that. Yeah, it was um, it was uh, it was incredibly successful as well. It, it did really, really well. Um, I think it was cancer, Irene. I think it says so on her IMDb. Uh, if you want to have a uh, a quick look there, um, uh, let's just uh, skip through the rest of the pictures here. See what we've got. There's the two of them together. They have really good chemistry, uh, actually. Richard Chamberlain and um, this lady. Now, this actor here is Damien Thomas. Damien Thomas is still alive. 
And uh, I wrote to him actually yesterday. Uh, he's got a fantastic career behind him. Uh, currently lives in France. Um, I'm going to see if I can try and get him on uh, the channel. Uh, yeah, Tom, she was very, very beautiful. And I'm, uh, and actually, she did a really um, quite um, uh, controversial black and white photography uh book and uh, Japanese actresses didn't do a lot of nude photography back then but it was an incredibly successful book um and um uh, it's worth looking that up as well um yeah, a very talented woman this actor's great Damien Thomas who plays father Alvito again kind of one of the um religious characters who's who's sort of plotting behind the scenes uh, to sway influence uh, with Tanaga one way or another. Uh, Blackthorn is literally the thorn in his side. He's suspected of burning Blackthorn's ship. Um, but later we find out, of course, that's not the case. Which would um, have been a very easy thing to believe in that day and age. Yeah, I, I actually, when I watched it as a kid, um, I was quite with the ending. I kind of, I think, because the ending is mainly explained in voiceover, um, supposedly the voice of Tanaga, um, uh, voiced by Orson Welles, kind of voicing his thoughts. I, I don't think I got it. I think I, I, I missed it that Tanaga was ultimately uh, behind it all because he wanted to he keep was. him. He was, so, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, was this dude in Sinbad? Yes, he was. Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. You're talking about actor Damien Thomas, which is another reason I want to get him on. Um, so, yeah, David Macy saying this show is responsible for his romantic choices in life. Oh, won't hold that against you, sir. Uh, production design in this show. Again, you've got to remember this is 1980, so television dramas very much in their inf inf you know infancy. Um, they spent a lot of money on this, um, and you can still see it um, in the show today. It will look tame compared to uh, some of the things um, that we see uh, production standard-wise. And, of course, this is all pre-CGI, so anything physical you see is there it's it's not been built on the horizon in a computer or, or or whatever um use of locations and so on is is very effective costumes are excellent um the music is good that is the golden hind ship that was built especially for this movie which i didn't realize was the case um and that ship is currently the golden hind that is located in london so um that's where that's where that is. This actor's great. That's that's Omi, yeah. Yeah, he's he's uh Yuki Maguru. Um I don't know if he's still alive. I'm just gonna check quickly actually. But he's he's kind of um he's an interesting character because his character's got a really great arc in the in the show. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Um off. He's a, a samurai at the village. He appears to be um, uh, an assistant to uh, Yabu. Yabu is the lord of the village. I think Omi is like his right hand man at the time. And um, he doesn't. Uh, he obviously doesn't like westerners, but that that's pretty par for course in that part in that day and age. Mm -hmm. uh, he gets on Blackthorn's bad side right away because he has one of his men boiled alive. Well, he also he also imprisoned them all too. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, and and also he he um, uh, urinates on Blackthorn. <laughs> there's that. Yeah, so there's that great arc with all this build up that at the end Blackthorn could take his ultimate revenge yep. on this character. Yep. Yep. But, but he doesn't. He doesn't. That's and, great. Um, it, this this guy can't believe it. He can't believe that he's. Um, I can see that, you. You can see it in his face leading up to that. Sound like, like, oh my god, the, the, I'm I'm gonna lose my love to this gaijin. <laughs> yeah, because Tanaga basically gifts Blackthorn his wife, effectively. 
and um, I'm not sure why Tanaka does that. Um, um, yeah, and the book explains it a little a little better. She's um, what you might call um, not not freelance. It's a it's she should we say uh, someone that was very high, uh, highly competitive. Uh, men were very highly competitive to win her hand because she was because she was so talented in uh, as in the arts of of the uh, the geisha, and right? For obvious reasons, and so she was very highly sought after. That that's so her so her contract would have been worth a lot, in right? That, in their society, right? Got you. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, all of this stuff was like lost on me as a kid. I just wanted to see the bits with sword, swords and ninjas. Um, it, it's it's only now that you can kind of appreciate, you know, all the kind of social complex complexities and the culture and um, the many, many things that the um, narrative of this miniseries ex explores. Uh, Tom, it was written by James Clavell. Uh, he wrote a number of books including a pretty good book called Whirlwind, which is worth checking out. I think one of the books, isn't one of the books a sequel to Shogun that he wrote? If, if it is, I, I don't know. Oh, okay. Did you read any of his other books then, or just this no, one? No, just, just the one. It was about 30 years ago. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's... Uh... And also, another thing about the book is, uh, in the foreword to the book, he mentioned that he's playing with history. He acknowledges that, and he's explaining why he's changing their names. The, 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 some of the, a lot of these characters are based on real historical people, but he's not calling them by historical names as a part to uh, as part of his exercise in playing with history. He's telling a story that mirrors history, but doesn't correspond to history. Yeah, and, yeah. All the, the real, yeah, the real history is very sophisticated. Yeah, and I, I think as a writer, that probably gave him a lot more luxury in terms of you know what he could what he could do with the characters and, and make it more adventurous, I suppose. Um, this is Tanaga ready and dressed to go for war. Now, what, one thing I found disappointing both as a child and as an adult is that the huge battle that we seem to be building up to is basically seen off screen in the last episode and, and, and um, effectively a footnote. Whereas I thought we were going to see his army take on the army of his rival and, and you know, we were going to see that battle. I was waiting to see a scene with a thousand extras. Now, of course, modern Japanese uh, cinema would certainly depict that sequence. I I'm sure that we're going to get it in the new version uh, that drops next week. Originally, I thought it was well, it was originally scheduled to drop tomorrow night, but they they moved it to next week. So yeah, you're referring to uh, the Battle of Sagagahara. That's the most famous battle in the history of Japan. That was October twenty first, sixteen hundred. Yeah, because it's after that 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 that's what it's after that he was able to unite the main three warring factions, and and which sort of led to the period of prosperity, right? Yeah, the Takagawa Shogunate that lasted all the way to the Meiji Restoration of the mid eighteen hundreds. There you go. This is why this is why we have Darth on the channel to uh, uh, fill in the blanks with these 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 bits. Um, yeah. So um, uh, it, it's they didn't want Richard Chamberlain originally for this role. Uh, it was actually offered to Sean Connery, but uh, who would have been an interesting choice, and I think he would have done a good job. But Connery. Um, had disliked working in Japan when he shot You Only Live Twice and didn't particularly want to go back there. And he didn't want to spend six months, which is, I think, how long the contract was for, filming um, in Japan. Unlike other TV shows of the time, this was shot on, um, you know, Kodak uh, film uh, with film cameras, 35 mil. Uh, it was not shot in a te television format of the 80s, which is just as well, because if it was, it would have looked terrible. Um, I don't think that would have served it um, at all well. It's got some ver varying uh, different box set posters and, and, and so on. Now, John Rhys Davis, who many there people recon recognize from Lord of the Rings, uh, he turns up as a sort of Portuguese um, mercenary sailor, uh, Vasco Rodriguez. Um, he always calls um, uh, Richard Chamberlain's character Inglés. Hey, Inglés. 
Uh, I've got hot hot beef in my cabin and all that, which all sounded very suspect. I thought he was going to get murdered or worse. But, um, yeah, he's kind of playing both ends in this um, in in the show. Are there any vast differences between him in the show and him in the book? Not really. It's it's a bit more. Um, he's a bit more duplicitous in in the book. In the uh, in the uh, he, he he tries to kill Blackthorn on the boat, and he tripped that. They show that in the series, but yeah. Um, I guess they did show it in in the series too. He he rides to his house with the intention of assassinating him at one point. Yeah, they did show that in the series actually, but uh, he got disarmed before he could get close to Blackthorn. Yeah, there's that scene where they search him thoroughly and he's got like a, he's got a knife in his hat he's got two hits secreted in his belt he's got an, a, um, two knives and a small pistol secreted in his boot and you know about another six knives on his body so um that was actually this was one of the first shows to do that hey this person's got lots of weapons uh on them he, he was also very blunt <laughs> he's like no no thank the bastard summer <laughs> yeah um he's good in it he's good in he's good in the show um this actor uh i forget his name I think a, that's, that's lord ashido i don't know the ashido yeah right so it's nobu uh kaneko um again i think he might be it might have been a stand-up comedian at the time uh as well and he's sort of pl he plays one of the other rival warlords if i remember rightly um then you have uh just various other stills of the production i think we've seen most of these already let's just see if there's any of the other actors um i'm looking to see if uh the guy who plays all the villains in various things uh, if they've got still of him but maybe not um no back to the beginning so um yeah, the, yeah the, the, you got all the main characters. There, there's a few minor characters that you met, like like uh, Mariko's husband, uh, the father visitor, the uh, the Portuguese. Well, a few of the other people I want to mention is, first of all, George Innes, who um, is one of the surviving members of the crew. Uh, people might recognize him from the Italian job, where he is one of Michael Caine's merry men uh, in the operation. And there he is in the background of that shot, along with Michael Caine and Benny Hill, Margaret Bly. Um, George Innes is still alive. And I have written to him three times, actually, because I've tried to get him on my channel before, because he's been around forever, born in 1938. Um, he's been in Master and Commander as well, Stardust, uh, 154 acting credits. Um, it would be great uh, to get him on the channel if I can. Um, 88 years old. Uh, if well, you know, some people are pretty. I don't, you'd be surprised, man. My dad was pretty sharp right up until he passed away. Whether whether I can get him or not, I don't know. But I've I've written to him a few times. Um, his character in in the the show. This was a scene I never understood as a kid. So um, he goes on shore with Blackthorn when they find the boat that the erasmus it's been burned and um he sort of has some kind of madness fit and then he dies in the book what what happens in the book because i kind of it, it's the same thing in the book they don't really explain what happened he just loses his mind and i guess he i don't know why he he literally died i don't i don't know the reason i'm sorry so he sort of seems to lose his mind and kind of have a heart attack basically Kind of I, I, I think he, he just started hyperventilating and he and he couldn't drop. He maybe he just hyperventilated to death. Yeah, I guess you can do that. Well, look um, at I mean I mean he he, he didn't want to be there. He's a prisoner. He wants to get off the island. He looks at Blackthorn like uh, for hope. Like like okay, he he's moving up into sight. He seems to be somebody now, an important yeah. guy. Maybe he can get us off the island. So I think he's hanging on to that hope. And then when they uh, sail into the the harbor and he sees the boat destroyed, he's like, he just he just loses it. At that at that point, what had happened to the rest of the crew? Because they kind of got written out off screen, it seemed. Yeah, they they show them at one point. He starts recruiting some of the members of his crew, and you can see them on the beach where they have to stand on the they have to step on the portrait of them of uh, 
Yeah, uh, I remember Madonna that. Christ, yeah. So, but they never show what happens to them beyond that. You're right. They don't. Sh- they they never explain what happened to them. And I don't remember what happened to them in the book. It's been thirty years since I read it. <laughs> well, I'm guessing by the time we see George Innes's character, they're all presumed to have died. That's that's what I got. Um, they're not in the best of health. Well, but they were like living in that hut with a load of grog and kind of like four ladies of the night sort of thing um it seemed it seemed to be the case a couple of other notable actors is the late um alan baydell uh is in it playing um uh one of the priests characters his classic actor died sadly very young of a heart attack um his wife was also an actor his daughter is an actor many people will remember him as one of the main ministers from the day of the jackal um but he had an excellent career it's in a number of you know big classic movies from the fit sort of late 40s 50s and 60s um then you also have michael horden who was a british institution um back in his day sadly also no longer with us again playing another religious figure people remember him as adam Rowland in where eagles dare the voice of frith in watership down uh and Many, many, many other credits. Two hundred and six um, credits. Um, well, which you know. one? They only showed three priests. He's um, he's in the he's 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 the priest that's in the yeah. You're thinking of the wrong priest. He's the priest that's in the prison. Oh, the Franciscan priest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there, there's actually a basis in history for that. The Franciscans went to Japan. And they and they um, they they've always been a uh, like a, a, a preference for the poor, so they are always helping the poor. They were they, that's what they were dedicated to, right? And when the Jesuits went to Japan, they they wanted they usurped their influence and just sort of pushed them out. So there's actually so what he tells Blackthorn in the prison, there's actually a, a, a basis for that. It's funny here. He Michael Horden here is pictured with Peter Jeffrey in Anne of a Thousand Days, and I just directed Victoria Jeffrey, who is Peter's daughter, um, in the play about the post office scandal. So, small world. <laughs> you know, everybody's connected to somebody who's connected to somebody in this industry. Um, yeah, so Michael Horden, very long, prominent career um, in the industry played a really interesting range of characters, including Scrooge and uh, all sorts, um, and a number of military roles as well. I think you'll find him in Sink the Bismarck, I think is another one he's in. Spy Who Came In From The Cold with Richard Burton. Yeah, they should remake that, by the way. Yeah, yeah, Sink the Bismarck would definitely is worthy of a remake just simply because of the effects of the day. Um, you know, I'd be quite happy to see somebody make it with modern effects sequences inserted and just get it's, it. And, it, and it's high drama. What happened to the HMS Wales, uh, Prince of Wales was really, was really traumatic. Yeah. You, well, you mean, um, no, I think you mean the hood. There were, there were two British capital ships involved in the battle of Denmark Strait. We're, we're getting a lot off topic here. So I'll, I'll yeah, a little bit. Um, there, there but were, the there one, were two the, warships, the there one, the, warships the, the one that went the the one that went straight up in flames was the hood. It took one shot and it um, hit the ammunition store, broke the ship's back, um, uh, killed everybody on board except for three people. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll elaborate later. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, yeah. So I, I'm very keen. We've got eight people watching. Thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, if you've got a comment you want to put up about when you first saw this, Oh, I'll make a I'll make a comment. Um, I heard this, and it's really funny. Is that when when Shogun originally aired, yeah, uh, or aired multiple times, uh, Japanese restaurants actually closed down, and they hang a sign saying, "We're closed to watch Shogun." Really? Yeah, I heard that. That's interesting. Uh, I'm um because I'm they didn't have they, they didn't. Like that in London. They, yeah, there weren't a lot of VCRs in 1980, so if you wanted to watch something, no. you had to go home. <laughs> yeah, you had to be a bit rich to like VCRs in 1980 were like 400 pounds, and 400 pounds is like 4,000 pounds in today's money. So, um, yeah, this is um, Hikone, Hikone Castle, uh, where the exteriors of the castle were filmed. It's a museum today. You can go and look round. 
Um, the Osaka Castle? No, it's not Osaka Castle. Um, it's, I think it represents Osaka Castle. Yeah, that, that's what that's what, what I meant. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, that's what I meant. I'm sorry. Yeah, but this is this is where they actually um, they actually filmed it. So um, yeah, so it's not in central Japan. It's um, further further out, uh, and it's actually on a on a lake rather than on the coast, uh, which is um, interesting. Nearest big city is Otsu, so um, that is where they filmed the castle sequences. Uh, for Shogun, and again, I suspect it was a lot less built up um, back in 1980. Uh, David Macy saying, first saw it on TV when it first aired. Bought the DVD about six years ago and watched watched it about once a year since. So, so you're a diehard fan, mate. Diehard fan. Tom was four. Yeah, I used to have the DVD, but I gave it away to somebody and he moved to Oregon, so I don't have it anymore. <laughs> oh man, you don't 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 lend people your DVDs. That's a that's a big no no. Um, I, I learned that the hard way. I lost a couple of my movies. Uh, Metropolitan, I lent to somebody. Actually, I think that was a VHS. Didn't 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 get it back. So um, the, the the reason that that um, uh, Shogun got commissioned uh, was because of the success of roots which uh, came out in 1977 and jesus of nazareth 1977 um but shogun was the first one all shot overseas much bigger budget than either of those two um and um there was this feeling of okay if this one doesn't work it's going to be a lot harder to get other stuff uh, commissioned guys uh, but fortunately, it was a huge success. Success. It had the highest weekly Nielsen ratings, no connection to my name, uh, that week. And uh, the second highest in television history, with ABC's Roots uh, being number one. Uh, so it led to North and South being commissioned, The Thornbirds, and a whole heap of um, other stuff. Um, yeah, I think it's also the first time I'd ever seen someone getting beheaded um yeah that's true the, the the first person yeah omi does that, that that's the the first person that dies on the series it just comes and it comes out of nowhere yeah it's and it's, and, and, and you're supposed to have you shocked the same way to like black remember watch that scene watch the reaction of black things like what the hell did you just do yeah because <laughs> he doesn't i mean he just doesn't get the um you know he, do, he doesn't understand how the culture works and of course um his um love interest uh, that character is forever having to explain to him no you can't do that no you can't say that that you'll offend people um you know and um she keeps him out i mean she stops him from getting killed um quite a number of times uh yeah, it's, yeah she's li she literally gets in front of him with the guy with, with about to shoot him with the bow yeah um see so, Yoko um, Shimada, who, like I said, oh, 69 she was when she passed away. Um, it's probably, I mean, I don't know how much else of hers I've seen, but for a Japanese actress that young to get an opportunity like this um, to be in a show of this quality, um, and I don't know how old she was when this photograph was taken. It says 2012 here. So, I mean, God. She was still looking amazing in 2012. Um, yeah, I've been watching uh, North and South. Um, I've had it on when I've been doing my American Civil War games. So, yeah, I've just been re-watching that again for, I think, like the fourth fourth time um, that I would have seen it. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, people should... Um, check out her other work uh she has got 43 other credits obviously a lot of it's japanese production but she was also in uh the 1995 production of crying freeman which isn't a terrible film i quite enjoyed that actually um i know that you know it's based on an existing ip and some people were not very happy with it um i i don't couldn't really compare it to anything i quite liked it um so did you see the crying freeman when it came out no, I've never heard of it. Well, it's a sort of action adventure movie. Uh, it's worth seeing. Um, so if you get a chance to watch it, uh, you know, it, it's not, not too bad at all. Um, 
So sure, I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll watch anything you recommend. North and South is the one with Patrick Swayze. That's that's got very young um, Patrick Swayze. I have also been in touch with one of the actors from North and South because I'm going to do a special about that as well. Uh, he has agreed to come on. We're just trying to work out some dates and times. Um, here's some other shots of uh, Yoko's other work, which are in honor, honor of her memory. I thought it might be nice to just kind of pop up. So, um, yeah, and if you can find the book that she did, well, I'd grab a copy. If you can find a signed one, well, that would be worth a lot of money. There she is with Stephen Seagal in the – not Stephen Seagal, sorry – Christopher Lambert, looking like Steven Seagal in The Hunted, uh, which I have seen, but I can't remember if it was any good. That should, te that should tell you something. Um, yeah, so Chamberlain and her have pretty good chemistry, don't you think? I agree, yeah. Yeah, I think so. And um, I was actually kind of surprised that it went as far as they did when they actually got to the point where they were in bed together. I was surprised that they took it that far. Yeah, I mean... It's probably a body double when she takes her robe off because you just see that shot from the back, and I suspect that was somebody else um, because it would be quite dishonourable for an actress to do that in Japanese culture of her standing and the family she came from. But regardless of how they did that, the, the amount of nudity that you see is, of course, tamed by today's standards. But again, I keep saying this, you've got to remember this was 1980. Um, so for actors to get their clothes off on screen was was quite rare. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a there's a fair bit of for the time there's a fair bit of nudity um, in that uh, sequence. Um, there are some there are some there are some negatives to the show. Um, uh, like I said, one is I think it would have been great if we had seen the big battle at the end. Two, it's begging for a sequel, which we never got. Um, and and you could have done a sequel, and it could have been interesting. Um, uh, three is quite slow. Uh, it is quite overwritten in places. And four, I don't think modern audiences uh, will like the lack of subtitles. Um, so I'm going to be very interested to see if we're going to get subtitles in the new version. Uh, that's dropping next week. Are you looking forward to seeing that, Josh? I am, and um, I'll mirror something you said just now. I was talking to a friend of mine a little while last night about this. He said he thought the Shogun series, although it was really interesting to see on TV, he thought it was a bit too campy. Yeah, I think that's a fair criticism. Okay. Uh, it's also the... St I think the st you've got to remember the style of acting was very different back then. You know, and the, the way stuff was shot and the way stuff was directed, everything about the whole style of creativity back then is very different to now. That's interesting. Um, that's, that's the sort of observation I wouldn't have been able to make. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I think it... I think Chamberlain's very good in it. Um, I think Connery might have given us a performance with more presence... But Chamberlain really threw himself into the role and Clavel, who had resist, resisted Chamberlain being cast and was quite upset. Um, he wanted Albert Finney if they couldn't get Connery. I don't think Albert Finney would have worked for this part. Um, but uh, let's have a look at some shots of the um, new one, which I'm going to be reviewing, by the way, uh, when it comes out. Um, yeah, so... Uh, here it is. I'm just going to close that down. Um, and as you would expect with modern lighting and all the rest of it, um, it's a very, very different look. Uh, plus, of course, they have the whole array of visual effects uh, to um, bolster the show. Now, I believe this is dropping weekly from next Wednesday. I don't know if it's dropping all in one go. Do you have any info on that? Oh, no. I, I'm, I, was, I was hoping you would give me info. <laughs> ah. Well, let's try and find out while we're here. Right. Um, let's see. Uh, let's have a quick look. Is Shogun... 
And I think this actually, this show was originally due to screen in 2023, but was partly delayed, uh, I guess, as a knock-on effect of COVID and various other things. Well, yeah, that did, that did it delayed everything, including the Olympics. Yep. Uh, Shogun will premiere its first two episodes on February 27th, Hulu FX. The remainder of the 10-episode series will release weekly. So, um, yeah, and again, it's, it's based on the book again. So this is a remake um, or, or, or a reimagining of the book. Um, the lead British actor in it is Cosmo Jarvis, uh, who's a pretty decent actor. I dare say we'll see him in there. He is, um, and uh, he's he's got quite a few good roles behind him already, um, but nothing so iconic that would be distracting from him playing John Blackthorne, who again loosely based on um, William Adams, uh, who died in sixteen twenty. So, um, Hiro Yoki Sanada, I think is how you say. Um, this actor's name, and forgive me if I pronounce any of them wrong, uh, Western audiences will already be familiar with him being the main lead opposite Tom Cruise in The Last Samurai. He's, of course, in Rush Hour 3. Um, he's been in Mortal Kombat. Um, and he's been in loads of other films, uh, Speed Racer, Minions, not that you'd necessarily recognise him from Minions, uh, Bullet Train. He was also in Westworld. Um, so, yeah, I was actually, actually going to ask if they, they could uh, take a lot of the Japanese actors that were in The Last Samurai and put them in here. Like, they'd be. There was, yeah. a, there was a lot of good. There was, some of the guys had good presence. Uh, yeah, The Last Samurai has a fantastic cast. Um, so uh, the, the lady who's playing, uh, I think, the main romantic interest. Uh, I think she's she's from New Zealand, I think. So, um, yeah. We'll, we'll, oh, he looks evil. I don't know who he's playing, but he looks evil. <laughs> so he, he, um, he, could, he could be the ninja. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, that's one of the things I'm really looking forward to seeing in this show is the ninja castle attack because I'm I'm you know I'm keen to see how that's done um, in this show. Um, but I, I'm I just I think they're going to be able to visualize Japan a bit more authentically because you're going to have the uh, you're going to be able to use the effects you've got, of course. Um, costume design is a lot more sophisticated, it's a lot more advanced. These costumes look a lot more elaborate. Um, perhaps, That's dare true. I say, they'll be more accurate because maybe they have more money to spend or um we shall see yeah the archer is probably mariko's husband right oh yes uh the show was um scheduled to shoot originally in march 2019 um and the uk uh but it was postponed because it was felt that the production you know the preparation that had happened up until that point wasn't good enough and they wanted it to look better they wanted it to go bigger so they did a single day of filming in order for um, fx channel to retain the rights while it was being retooled um and then of course you know hey ho covid came along in 2020 um and the original writer was no longer available so there was a lot of chopping and changing it didn't start principal photography until september of 21 um and again, it was UK and uh, Japan. It took two months longer than expected. So I dare say the budget, and I, I can't find out what the budget was on this show, uh, but it went up substantially. Did, um, does it does it bother you that it's not filmed in Japan? No, it is. It is filmed in Japan. It is okay. I, I saw someone comment that it wasn't being filmed in Japan. So I guess that wasn't true. No, no, no. That's not true. Um, it was filmed in the UK and Japan. So, um, uh, yeah, Keith is saying, bring back Darth for future discussions. His knowledge on this is that's outstanding. Yeah, well, I, I, I like doing historical stuff, so um, absolutely, man. Now, we Harry Bosch. Judging on the trailer of the new Shogun, it's in that typical grim dark lighting 
that is used in every medieval era movie. I prefer the colourful 80s setting. I think a happy medium would be something that um, I would like to see. Um, but yeah, I, I understand what you're saying about, about the 80s lighting and setting. It looks like it's, it's like uh, the same thing you would see like on the A-Team or the V-Series. They, they, yeah. all, they all had the same lighting. It, 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 I mean, it, it does. One thing I will say about Shogun, even though it's got the vistas and it's got the, um, you know, it's got the production value, it does look very flat. Um, it's very flat in a lot of the shots, um, you know, so I'm expecting modern techniques to really up the game on this one. RRTNZ, bless you, sir, putting in your, your hand in your pocket for your hard-earned pennies. We've loved to have been there for this as someone who saw the original in 1980. Best miniseries ever. Sadly, I'm at work. Oh, well, Gambate. Well, don't worry, mate. You can come back and watch it in uh, replay. Joe K, who's obviously a fan of The Last Starfighter. Good on you, sir. One of my favourite sci-fi films of all time. I love you, Alex Rogan. Never has romance been so high in a movie. When the original show played in Greece, the streets were clearing from traffic. Oh, were they now? It's funny. Uh, yeah, Calispera. Um, so with the politics as in film, I predict new Shogun is going to be absolutely massive and sweep the board at the awards. I think it's going to do pretty well. I mean, I'm liking what I'm seeing. Um, I am liking what I'm seeing. <laughs> I think that guy might lose his head. Um, but we shall see. We shall see. Um, the Flintlocks look a bit more sophisticated. I do, I do love that costume. Absolutely love that costume. Um, so I don't know. We'll 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 see. I think I think we're gonna see more battles in this version of, of Shogun. And you know what? That is absolutely fine with me. Yeah. So uh, uh, I I wanted to mention before I forget, um a difference between the book and the and the series is um and, and how they explain things. Do you yeah. Remember, you remember when Blackthorn goes to his house? He was given a house, and he goes there, and there's this and there's this girl that's assigned to him. Like this, this yeah. girl belongs to you. Okay. I don't remember the girl's name, but um, that girl actually in the book they, they explain it where she comes from. Um, you remember in the episode two where Toranaga talking with Blackthorn, and then the stopped because the Sheeta shows. So Blackthorn has to move off to the side with uh, a a veto and he says don't say anything and blackthorn tried to say something in the in the samurai in front of him turns around like he's going to draw his weapon yeah i know exactly the scene you mean yeah. that guy who who almost draws his weapon is actually the husband of the girl that goes to see blackthorn and, right. right but what they don't show you after blackthorn leaves that guy that japanese guy would uh turned out he was a bit too hot-headed uh, got offended by Ashida being rude to Toronaga and, and he tried to draw a weapon on Ashida. They, they say that in the book, but they don't show it in the series. And Toronaga was uh, very put off by that and said, go outside and commit suicide right now. So the reason, so, so when they tell you in the series, they say, oh, well, her husband died recently. They don't tell you it was that particular guy. So I just thought I'd show that. Right, okay. The, the actress who plays... Um... The lady assigned to Blackthorn. Yeah, that was a very young girl. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, she wouldn't be so much now, but um, her character. Do you recall her character's name? Is it Fujiko? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. So she was played by Romy Seno, uh, who's only got four acting credits. Um, two of them are Shogun. One was called Nozomi Witches, and the other one is for a film in 2004. Uh, beyond that, I can't find anything else out about her, but it does appear that she's still alive. So um, if I can if I can track her down uh, and I can get her to come on, it would be great to have someone who worked on this show um, talk about, uh, you know, not just all the stuff that went on with the filming and everything but also um uh you know what it was like uh, in japan back then and also what the response was in japan to the show because i'm i can't um 
find much information about that. Um, obviously, people are over here, ex expat Japanese, so to speak. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that either. We're pretty keen, but yeah, uh, you know, was the book widely read in Japan? I don't know. Um, so it'd be interesting to 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 find out the answer um, to those things. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, Shogun, nineteen eighty. As I said uh, earlier, um, there are feature film versions of it available. Uh, one is 145 minutes long. Another one is 125 minutes long. I dread to think what that one's like. Don't uh, don't get those. They're rubbish. I avoid them like the plague, yes. <laughs> yeah, there is, a, there is a DVD disc set. It's available on Amazon. Uh, you can buy it. Um, it's... it's, it's you know, you're not getting it for your kids. I think if you're over 40, you'll know some of the actors. There's a good chance that you'll enjoy this. It's probably not for the under 25 market because I think the pacing would just be too slow. I saw um, it when I was a kid. I loved it. I, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you saw it as a kid in, 90, in the 1980s. <laughs> kids under 25 now have been brought up on Lord of the Rings and, you know, um visual effects movies and historical stuff of a caliber that is of a different pace and filmed in a different time i mean right. i really liked by the sword divided which is a bbc drama about the english civil war i had one of the actors who was in that on my uh, channel a few weeks ago um but it's you know if you watch an episode of it now it is very much a tv show of its day um I think the pacing of this is of the style back then. And also, Clavel had quite a lot of control over the miniseries. Um, so he was getting as much of his book in there as he could. And I'm not saying that there are scenes that can go. Um, when you're watching it, it's all important stuff. But um, it, 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 is, it, it is of its time. It's still, I think there's still a lot about it that's really, really good. Um, especially the performances, but um, yeah, but but don't buy it for your kids. Um, <laughs> uh, Melvin, thank you for tuning in, buddy. Uh, yeah, you've got to go on the uh, Drinkers channel, which I'll be um, uh, jumping over to in a second to do a bit of moderating. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's it for this. I think we're going to wrap this up here. Um, uh -huh. Darth, are you popping up anywhere else in the near future? Anything we can plug or mention for you? The only time I'm ever really on TV on, on YouTube is really on um, the uh, the Bro Network RMB show and uh, RM show called Positive Fandom, and I'll, yes. be on, I'll be on there tomorrow. I go I go on there uh, uh, weekly on Fridays. What's she doing week. tomorrow? We're doing uh, episode six of Masters of the Air. Ah, oh, right. Yeah. Cool. 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 We did that. Um... I'm doing that on Sundays, um, and uh, yeah, episode um, uh, episode five was amazing. Yes, it was it was the best really, episode to date. Yeah, episode four was not a good episode. It just had some. No, no, four, four. Yeah, four. Four was a, was not a good episode. I agree, yeah. but I do love the scene where the mechanic was working on the plane on the engine while the plane was moving. Yeah, that was great. I mean, there was good stuff in episode four. Um, all the stuff with the ground crews and, and that stuff was good. I did. I even didn't mind the scene with the Polish woman, which some people really hated. But the things I didn't like. Why? I like that scene. No, I liked it. Some people didn't like it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> too, too cliche. But um, but this is the forties. Everything's going to be cliche, you know. But. Um, uh, the, 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 the things I didn't like about it were that the village that was supposedly in France, the design of it was all wrong, the roofs of the buildings were all incorrect, the, it looked nothing like a, a, a European village in mainland France, Belgium or Holland. I thought that was supposed to be Belgium, yeah. Flanders, yeah, it's supposed to be Belgium. Yeah, Belgium, roofs, Belgium roofs have a very specific design in the 1940s. Okay. Um, you know, their chimneys have a race, but it just didn't look anything like um, it should have done. That that didn't really bother me that much. It was it was fine. It was because we know the show's all shot in England. But the um, thing that really annoyed me was that scene in on the train 
where everybody's talking English really loudly in front of other people who are just wandering past, who could be collaborators, who could have just turned around and said, those guys are whispering in English. I think they're suspicious. Can I have my reward money, please? You know, I mean, I know that things like that did happen. People did panic and were nearly caught and stuff. But I just thought the whole way it was shot, it just looked rubbish. It just wasn't believable. Um, so that that really took me out of the, the, the show, but yeah, apart I, from that, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, I, I like the uh, the resistance, that whole story about the resistance, but not necessarily for this show. Right. Yeah, we'd rather spend time with these characters either in England or in the air. I think. I don't think we need a great escape story. Well, it's like there's, there's nine episodes for the season, so we're getting pretty close to the end. There's only four more episodes left, and we're not even to 1944 yet. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. One of the episodes is a prisoner uh, prison camp episode. So oh, okay. um, and another episode is going to be focused on Red Tails. So that's the other criticism I've got with the show is it's definitely one episode too short. If anything, they could have done 12. Um, and I also think the show plus credits should be at least an hour long, you know, an hour plus credits. 40 minutes is too short. Yeah, the, the credits are very long. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's 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 like 41, 41 and a half minutes of actual material plus credits. You know, it's um, so, uh, yeah. But anyway. All right. Well, great. Um, thanks very much for popping on. Thanks for coming um, I've got more historical stuff coming up. So, um please do come back again. Thanks for everybody uh, for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and all that kind of stuff. Thanks for popping in if you haven't been before. I'm going to be back on Sunday with the Masters of the Air. I'm going to be doing a gaming stream later playing the South. I'm going to be doing uh, the third part of my campaign. I've just won the Battle of Shiloh, so I'll be doing a little bit more uh where you can see that i've got a rifle brigade named after darth plato and numerous other people from the chat so if you want to have a unit named after you pop on that stream i'll probably be doing that around oh midnight uk time maybe a little bit earlier we'll um, be fatting for our rats yeah for our rats <laughs> uh and uh yeah i've lost us the south twice so third time's a charm we'll, we'll see what happens uh, until then, don't forget to tell the people that you care about that you love them, and uh, we'll speak to you all again real soon.